Discuss the ethical considerations surrounding conducting research for HIV treatment in low-income countries. So HIV is very prevalent in low-income countries and with this comes some really important things that we need to consider. So informed consent is one of the most important things that we consider when giving healthcare treatments to people as that involves them really understanding the risks, the benefits, the possible complications and what the treatment really entails and when conducting research it's really important that we tell people this as well. However, because of them being in a low income country, there may be language barriers, there may be cultural barriers that really prevent full informed consent being able to be reached. So that's something that's really important that researchers must consider. Do they have the provisions and the access to really help with the education and the understanding for people that would be involved in the research? And also as well, the idea of continuity of care and continuity of research and again, education. For low income and more developing countries, they do not have the same infrastructures available. That mean that once the researchers maybe go back and um, leave, do they have the opportunity to have healthcare providers if there are complications, if they have any questions that need to be answered, or if there are long-term effects that need to be notified to researchers. So I think that's something that's really important as well. And just in terms of specifically when we think about HIV and education is the real understanding of what the researchers are doing to understand that it's not going to affect behaviours then on. For example, if people think that they may have been cured from HIV and then going on to spread HIV unknowingly thinking that they had been treated or cured when this may not be true. So I think that's something that's also important to consider. So in general, um, HIV being prevalent in low income countries, it's really important that we try and tackle this and really help put the research out there so that we can increase their health but I think there are certain other provisions that come with this that need to be put in place. Education, access, and really just general support for those who are involved and engaged in the research to prevent any negative outcomes because our aim is to improve total health outcomes and not decrease them. Why do you think that the General Medical Council prevents doctors from treating patients that they know as friends or family? So the GMC have rules in place where we cannot treat friends or family and I think it's really important for safety. Um, if we think about the professional doctor-patient relationship, it relies on objective decision-making. And when we think about our family and friends, sometimes our judgment could be clouded due to emotions that we aren't necessarily in control of, which may lead us to over-prescribe something or over-treat for something that didn't need to be treated maybe because we feel sympathy rather than empathy. I think that's something that's really important to consider. As doctors, we should always practice empathy, not sympathy. And in these situations, it's not always possible. Something that I think is also important is the idea of bias and unrealistic expectations that are sometimes put on to the doctor by families or friends where they're sometimes the, a lot more of an emotional side to it where they can really place a lot of pressure on you which can lead you again to make a non-objective decision when it comes to treating them. I think what's important is that instead we understand that emotionality and that we accept it and instead offer an alternative to our friends and families such as recommending a doctor that we really hold in a high regard that we know will really look after them and treat them with the best intentions when we can acknowledge that sometimes we might not be able to do that in all situations. So I think in general the reason the GMC have this rule in place is to really protect patients and to have the most optimal care. And so I think as doctors, we need to recognize our emotionality and make these alternatives, like we said, with um, providing another doctor that could treat them in the same way. 
have a read through of the following passage. For viewers at home, feel free to pause the video. What factors should the NHS consider when deciding whether to fund proton beam therapy? I think the most important thing to consider initially is resource allocation and the NHS makes its decisions based off qualies which are quality adjusted life years and that's where we really consider the cost of the treatments, the impacts of the treatments and how long the treatments are going to last for the patients. So in this case, with the proton beam therapy, we would really want it to be evidence-based. So what is the current research saying? What are the clinical trials saying? Do we have numerical data when it comes to proton beam therapy of knowing how effective it is? Is it effective in certain populations with certain conditions or does it suit all people? I think that's really important to consider and especially when we directly apply it and compare it to the current gold standard which would have been given us the alternative in this case. So I think that's initially what we can consider but also safety just in general. We always want to improve our patient's health and with unknown treatments or treatments that aren't regularly given on the NHS it's really understanding the risks associated Associated with it to the patient, particularly with in the case of this passage, when given abroad of the healthcare provisions abroad, what the plan is that is in place if something was to go wrong, do they have the ability to carry on treatment over there, or would it be safe enough for them to fly back over to the UK to continue treatment with the NHS? And so ultimately, it is what's best for the patient. We want to have the best duty of care as possible, but also understanding the risks and the implications of doing so. And also I think we need to consider what would happen if we did go on to fund this specific treatment in terms of postcode lottery and access to all. NHS, we want to give access to all patients equally. Doesn't matter location. And so really considering would we be able to fund this for all similar patients in this case? Or is this just an isolated case because of alternatives that cannot be reached? And I think that's really important to consider because of a general attitude towards all populations. I think I've read about um, the postcode lottery issues sometimes when it comes to IVF treatments, where some areas give two rounds of IVF cycles um, on the NHS versus some giving three. And we want to eliminate this and to have equity and across all um, patients. So I think in general, this is a very complicated decision, both ethically and when thinking about funding and resource allocation. So I think the three main things in my mind that we need to consider are resource allocation, safety, and then this idea of postcode lottery and treatment access to all. Dr. Smith is a general practitioner, a GP, who's been friends with Mr. Jones for several years. During a social gathering, Mr. Jones approaches Dr. Smith and asks for a prescription for a medication he's been taking for a long time. What would your response be to Mr. Jones? So as Dr. Smith, I'd be very empathetic to the situation. I think I'd probably start off by acknowledging that in the current um, state that NHS is very understaffed, that wait times for appointments and to try and get in touch with your GP for prescriptions and medications can often be very difficult. And so I would start by acknowledging that and being empathetic. But I would also say that from a professional standpoint that as a friend, I would not be able to prescribe because the GMC prohibits this. And also that as a friend, I would want them to have the most optimal care that they can and that I would not be able to do that. If we think about it from a friendship perspective, I say as a friend, I don't necessarily know all of your medical history, your medical past, and therefore I can't advise you, particularly in this case where they've suggested they've been on a prescription for a very long time. Maybe they are needing to be in for a review where they need to take some observations to understand and whether the medication is having the impact that it could, if it's having a negative impact, 
or even maybe if there are new possible alternatives to this treatment. So also just saying that your doctor would be the best place, best person to go to because they know you the best and they have the best advice. So I would really apologize, say that I'm not able to do that and then offer them the advice of getting in contact with your the receptionist at the GP or a pharmacist to ask if you can have the medication review because you are in need of a prescription. Have a read through of the following passage. For viewers at home, feel free to pause the video. What are the arguments for and against a bone marrow transplant in a donor aged under 16? So I understand a bone marrow transplant to be a potentially life-saving treatment whereby we take someone else's bone marrow and give it to them where they can replenish their bloods for people who suffer from blood disorders. And so I think there are quite a lot of reasons for doing this. In this particular case in the passage, a sibling match tends to be the most well matched, so will have the highest chance of success in the treatment, less likely to have rejection and ultimately to have the cure. So in this case, it would be really recommended. And also with um, the bone marrow transplant is really well studied. It's routinely given. We understand the risks, we understand the benefits, and we really understand who are the best people to give it in these cases rather than alternative treatments being explored. However, in this particular scenario, the fact that it is a child under 16 can mean that we really need to consider the ethical implications. For someone who is under the age of 16 to have informed consent and to really understand what the procedure involves, whether that be the risks and the benefits, and for that decision to be made on behalf of them by their parent, is a really big decision to be made. Particularly with the emotional aspects with the families of sometimes a younger child not feeling that emotional pressure, feeling maybe burden or guilt if they didn't necessarily go ahead with that treatment, and maybe leading them into a treatment that they don't necessarily feel comfortable with. And I think that's something important to consider. And also the implications of the health of the child themselves, of the risks, of maybe in future life if there is something that occurs as a result of this treatment is something that's really important to consider. So I think in general, in this case, Bone marrow transplants can be given from people that are under the age of 16, but it requires a lot of emotional and family support and talking therapies and things like that to ensure that everyone is feeling as comfortable and as happy as they can, but also to try and have the best chance of success at a cure for this. Have a read through the following text. For viewers at home, feel free to pause the video. What ethical considerations should you take into account when considering whether to section the patient under the Mental Health Act? So I think the pillars of ethics that we really want to consider in this case is the fact that autonomy has been outweighed by non-maleficence, beneficence and justice. In this case, the patient could be deemed a risk to themselves and to others and so it's really important in this case for non-maleficence and be beneficence. Also that they are receiving the best care that they can by having these inpatient treatments where they have access to an MDT and senior review for potentially complex medical cases, that's really important that they're getting the best care they can and in this case that has to be done by a sectioning. So I think overall in this case, whilst their autonomy is not there, it's really important overall to help the patient um, receive the best treatment that they can. A patient is diagnosed with breast and ovarian cancer at 45. The doctor suspects that this could be related to a BRCA gene mutation predisposing her to cancer. The doctor offers the whole family genetic testing for the BRCA gene. The patient would like to undergo genetic testing, but her sister does not. Should the healthcare team perform genetic testing on this patient? 
So I understand the BRCA gene to be a mutation which increases the incident rate of certain cancers, particularly at an earlier life than expected. So I think it's important in this case to know whether it is a BRCA mutation or not because of the treatment and the delivery of the treatment. I've read about personalized medicine and how maybe there could be a specific treatment given when it is this genetic mutation. So I think to improve the healthcare outcomes um, and quality of life for the person who has been diagnosed with the breast cancer, it would be really important for them to know. So in that case, yes, but it's also important to acknowledge the sister saying no and to respect their autonomy in the decision making. But I think it's really important that the patient makes this as an informed decision and that they really understand both the benefits, but also the cons of knowing if they have the BRCA mutation. So from what I know, if we were to know that the sister has a BRCA mutation, they are offered um, increased screening. So offered screening at an earlier age and more regularly. So it's more of a preventative aspect. And maybe the option of preventative treatments such as mastectomies, where there is removal of the breast tissues to prevent any breast cancers arising. So there are also all of those pros if the sister was to know that, but also to respect that this is an incredibly emotional time and that for people to know this, it can be really difficult that, um, for them. But also to explain the idea of genetic counselling and the support and the therapies that can be given to really help the family through this incredibly difficult time. So I think in the current status of the question, we would look into the genetic basis for the, the person who that, ha that has been diagnosed to not do the check on the sister, but to help um, give her all of the options that are out there and really help support her through this incredibly difficult time. You are a GP working in a clinic and a 15 year old patient comes in for a routine checkup. During the consultation, the patient discloses that they are sexually active and would like the morning after pill as a form of medical contraception. The patient requests that this information be kept confidential from their family members. What ethical considerations should you take into account when managing this patient's care? So the first thing that I'd really want to understand is the safeguarding aspect initially. This is a child who is potentially at risk, so I'd want to understand more about the partner, um, whether they are safe and offer them any advice on that front and guide them in the right directions of support and charities and available to them and then after that if I was to determine that they were safe I think the Fraser guidelines are what's directly applied in this situation so the Fraser guidelines want to understand if the child really understands the pros and the cons of the contraceptive treatment if they are likely to continue to have sex. So I think it's really important to also understand whether they are likely to carry on with or without the contraceptive treatment and if it is in the patient's best interests for this to happen. And I think in this case, I'd also encourage them to really talk to their parents and to um, tell them this themselves, but also appreciate that if they fit all of the Fraser guidelines, then I am happy to give the contraceptive treatment without parental consent and parental knowledge. So overall, if I was in this scenario, the main thing that I would want straight away is to understand safeguarding, are they at risk? I would want to see if they um, follow the Fraser guidelines in terms of um, maturity and their knowledge of the implications of such treatment, but also again, encourage them to tell their family and to receive the support from their family as well. A patient has a terminal illness and is nearing the end of their life. They express their wish to die at home, but their family members want them to stay in the hospital. 
what should the healthcare team do in this situation? So if I was in this situation, I would really want to understand the decision making process from both the patient side and the family side and to help them understand that it's not just the option of home or hospital, that there are alternatives and lots of support available in this incredibly difficult time. So I would want to help them understand the ideas of a hospice. Um, which can offer really um, good support for those coming to the end of life where they can have access to nurses, they can have access to the whole uh, multidisciplinary team in, a, in an inpatient scenario which is separate from a hospital. There are also options at home such as district nurses so that if the patient does want to go home they can have that extra support and monitoring and also they're really helpful for the family if they have any questions it can be a really difficult time with patients being sent home of family members not quite knowing what to do in certain situations and really having that extra support can help maintain that the patient has a dignified death but also really support the family at the same time. I would also in this scenario want to understand what the whether there was a palliative care plan already put in place, what was put in place at that point and also the capacity of the patient to know whether there is a power of attorney that was put in place to make the decisions, the healthcare decisions, if they do not have capacity or whether they do have capacity and they can make informed decisions about their own healthcare. So I think in this scenario, there's many questions as to why and what the current situation is. But I think the main thing that the healthcare team really needs to do is offer support and the options and let them know all of the options that are available so that together as a healthcare team and as a family, as a patient, that we can have that decision making process together to reach the best healthcare outcome for the patient in the really difficult time. DNA CPRs or do not attempt cardiopulmonary resuscitation orders are doctors giving up on patients. How far do you agree with this statement? I understand DNA CPRs to be a decision that is made in collaboration with the patient, their families and the multidisciplinary team whereby they will not attempt resuscitation in the case of the patient's heart stopping because they do not feel like this would be in the patient's best interests. From what I understand, particularly in the frail population, if someone was to give a CPR in this case, they can really have a lot of damage that they will maybe not recover from, broken ribs, and it actually compromised their health um, to why, where they will probably not be able to recover. And I think it's interesting the statement of um, it's them giving up on their patients because just because someone has a DNA CPR in place, it does not mean that we completely remove all treatment. It is just the specific case of the resuscitation of the heart. So any normal medications, pain relief, say ventilation or complete support from the multidisciplinary team will still continue because we want the patient to have a dignified death. We want them to be um, supportive and in, have support and be pain free. Personally, I do not see it as someone giving up on a patient. I actually believe that it's in their best interests and for the sake of their health that this decision is made. So to conclude, I think that DNA CPRs really enable a dignified death for a patient. It means that they will not be put in harm and that they have the best treatment which the multidisciplinary team deems as most suitable for them. For more videos like this, be sure to check out our online interview course.